ready, you're ready for another session. You've heard the bells, and just like Pavlov's dogs, you're salivating and ready for more integration across the Earth's spheres. And it's time for Hydrosphere, which is terrific. So, look, let's not muck about. Let's go straight to Elizabeth Shadwick from CSIRO. She's based in Hobart. Take it away, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, I think so. Sorry, I've just abandoned you. That's all right. Sure, you're okay. sure that works. Thank you. And um, thanks for the opportunity to give a presentation here. I will say up front that while I have a great appreciation for the freshwater component of the hydrosphere, as an oceanographer, I'm going to focus on the oceans. So sorry about that. Um, that's a bias that we can deal with right up front. Um, and so this is about integrating the ocean with the other spheres. Um, and so thinking about putting this together, I, I think it's already come up a couple of times today, the climate catastrophe that we're all facing. The thing that comes to my mind really quickly these days is the um, climate service that the ocean is providing. And I think of that as two major services. One is the uptake of anthropogenic heat, and the other is the uptake of anthropogenic carbon. And we've had a great introduction to some of this already today. Um, the figure on the bottom left there is that the picture? here, this one, yep shows the uh, Earth's energy imbalance over this period, so two periods, one between the 70s and 2018, and then an, an updated one between 2018, and, or sorry, 2010 and 2018. And just focusing here on the 89, or if you like, in the more recent um, period, 90% of the excess heat in the planet is currently stored in the ocean. And I'll come back to the importance of one ocean in particular, which is in our backyard, the Southern Ocean, in, in doing the heavy lifting in, in addition to being the place where most of that anthropogenic heat is stored. So that's service number one. Um, service number two is depicted in this now somewhat out of date figure from the fourth IPCC assessment report. But I like it because the colors really starkly show where in the ocean, this is a column inventory, we have the largest proportion of anthropogenic carbon. So that's not just CO2, right? That's CO2 that comes um, out of the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, cement production, um, just human activities. So, um, it's a hot spot here in the North Atlantic, but the second most important area is this circumpolar band in the so-called subantarctic zone, so just south of us in Australia here, um, where we have a, a great deal of anthropogenic carbon which is being stored for us. So this service comes at a cost, um, and in terms of ocean warming, those costs are many. You um, can think of them as contributions to sea level rise, can think of them as um, potential contributions to the record low sea ice extent that we've seen, although we have difficulty attributing that to an anthropogenic signal. can think of that as contributions to destabilization of the Antarctic ice sheets, so those are cryosphere links. Um, for the anthropogenic carbon, the cost comes with changing ocean chemistry, so a decline in pH, or so-called ocean acidification, which has consequences for marine ecosystems and potentially implications for fisheries. So here is another opportunity to um, just let you in on a, a, a bias of my own to start with, which is that um, in addition to being an oceanographer, I'm a chemical oceanographer who focuses on the carbon cycle. So when I think about something in, in science that integrates the various spheres, I think about carbon. Um, and so this is a schematic from Woods Hole that shows the natural carbon cycle um, with a few shout outs to the anthropogenic perturbations of those, but it just nicely depicts how CO2, so inorganic carbon, moves from the atmosphere into the ocean and through the biosphere, through the biological carbon pump, which I'll talk more about, into the deep sea sediments, which then become fossil fuels, which are released back to the atmosphere. And so I think that one way of thinking about integration um, is also, this is a major challenge, right? It's a societal challenge, it's a scientific challenge, but it's also an opportunity for us to find ways to work more closely together. So I'm gonna focus on um, some science um, that, fo that really focuses on integrating the hydrosphere, as I said, ocean, sorry about the freshwater people, with the atmosphere through the exchange of carbon at the interface between the ocean and the atmosphere, also with the biosphere, the marine biosphere, not the terrestrial biosphere, the way that organisms help us to transfer carbon from the upper sunlit areas of the ocean into the deep sea. And if you squint your eyes, you might feel that um, possibly there's a smattering of, of geosphere relevance in that those sediments eventually, um, those particles eventually make their way to deep ocean sediments. Okay, um, and so I'd like to point out that we're already doing a, a really um, good job, I think, monitoring 
ocean change, and um, I'll focus particularly on the Southern Ocean, given its outsized importance for the um, storage of anthropogenic heat and also carbon. Um, and I would like to point out that I am mostly waving a biogeochemist flag and not a physical oceanography flag, but we have um, pretty good networks for physical oceanographic observations, temperature, salinity, oxygen, in addition to the biogeochemical things that I'm going to talk about. And those are via established networks. We've heard already from someone about the Global Ocean Observing System. There's the Southern Ocean Observing System. There's, of course, IMOS, who's represented here. And the third one that I've written there is the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, which I'll come back to. So we have, over many decades, used ships to observe the surface ocean. And the, the ship tracks that are shown there are, are largely research vessels and voluntary ships that measure CO2, which is an example. And the red lines, I think we can feel some domestic pride over the fact that those are the lines that have historically been maintained by Australia. So Australia does contribute more than its weight, if you like, or more than its dollars in terms of observing the Southern Ocean. And this is true for both the SOUP programs, the Southern Ocean, or sorry, the Ships of Opportunity program, and also for the Argo program program, which I'll come to. Um, but of course, ship-based observations are limited in both space and time, so they only give us the, that upper layer of the ocean and, and only when the ship is there. And over the last um, decade in terms of biogeochemistry and probably now two decades in terms of physical oceanography, we have really undergone an, a revolution in ocean observing. And that's been thanks to this network of, of robotic floats, Argo floats, or biogeochemical Argo floats that, that collect information and, and last from five to seven years in the ocean doing profiles about every 10 days. So this is just an example, and sorry for people who are not used to looking at plots like this, it might be a little bit confusing, but so this is a, a so-called um, repeat hydrography line. So this would be a section of the ocean that is reoccupied by a ship, which marches along and stops the ship and drops the CTD and collects full water column samples, um, and then goes another, another few, um, I think it's half a degree, and does it again and again and again. And we have the ocean is chopped up into these sections, and they're reoccupied by various nations in, in, about every 10 years. And so that allows us to do inventories of ocean heat and carbon from observations collected by ship. But as I said, we only repeat them about every 10 years. This is um, a line, this is New Zealand here, so the line in Pacific that was occupied by the US. It's the so-called P16 line. That's not really important. And these are the observations from the ship. And we're looking at pH here. The, these are examples of um, observations made by profiling floats that were deployed on that same voyage. So between, just as this, these stats are a little bit out of date, sorry about that, but between 2014 and 2021, more than 8,000 profiles of pH, which is a parameter that we have struggled to measure with shipboard observations, were obtained by Southern Ocean floats. Over the same period, we only made 1,000 profiles using our conventional shipboard observations. So this has really been transformative, so I'd just like to emphasize that. Um, and I've, li I've listed the Stockholm program there because the US really led the charge with this, but I should also mention that the Australian Argo program and the BGC Argo program, which also also is supported by IMOS, have, have done a big contribution to this. In addition to profiling floats, we have things now called autonomous surface vehicles or uncrewed surface vehicles. You may have heard of Sail Drone, did a circumpolar navigation not too long ago. Um, and then I wanted to show, oh, sorry, I'm pointing at my own screen. I wanted to show in this, so this is a kind of our backyard region. These are those two um, repeat hydrography lines, these sections that are repeated roughly every decade. Um, and this is a, a place close to my own heart that I'll talk about in a second, which is a, a long-term time series. So we heard a little bit this morning about the importance of time series, data quality, um, how do you know when you have enough? And so hopefully I can touch on some of those with the lens of, of, of um, working in the ocean. Um, I'd just like to say this is not news to anyone here, but that we really do need sustained observations. And particularly, I think that the hydrospheric community or the oceanographic community, and I think the cryospheric community, it's fair to say, is behind on our ability to attribute changes and extreme events to anthropogenic drivers. So this morning we had that really beautiful graph that was showing these are the observations, this is the natural variability, this is the human imprint that has to be there in order for these extreme events to happen. We're not yet there for something like, for example, the extreme low in Antarctic sea ice this year. So we're still struggling to have sufficient information to be able to attribute these things to anthropogenic change, which is not at all saying that climate change is not real or it's not happening. It's saying that the changes in the ocean, we're not always able to attribute them with the confidence that we would like to be able to. So enter SOTS, or the Southern Ocean Time Series, which is an IMOS facility. Um, it's also supported through the Australian Antarctic Program Partnership, and it's operated jointly between CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology. So got some good cryosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere collaborations in this one. 
Um, so I mentioned before the importance or outsized importance, I would say, of the Southern Ocean for the uptake and storage of anthropogenic heat and also for CO2. Predicting changes to the future climate in a global sense requires that we really have a good understanding of the processes that control these transfers. And because we're talking about time scales that range from diurnal, so day-night exchanges of heat, to two, three-day storm events, to um, decadal variations in, in large-scale climate drivers like El Nino, to possibly even um, glacial-type time periods, we need high-frequency observations and we need them to be sustained over many years. And so we're doing this at the Southern Ocean Time Series, which is shown by the red star there, southwest of Tasmania, between those two go ship lines and just south of the subtropical front with two deep water moorings. So I'll just give a little bit more detail about the two moorings. Um, but this is our kind of mission statement at SOTS, which I'll come back to this being also a platform for collaboration. That's how we think of it. So we want to be able to make autonomous, multi-trophic observations of Southern Ocean air-sea exchange. So that's the atmosphere hydro hydrosphere exchange production, so that's with the, bi the marine biosphere, that's biological production, carbon uptake, and the subsequent export and ultimate storage of carbon in the sub-Antarctic zone. So the first of the two moorings is this one. So it's called the, so the SOFTS mooring, or the so Southern Ocean Flex Station. Um, and it's, I, I won't have time to go into lots of detail about the platform itself, but this is a, a large surface float about the size of a small car that carries meteorological sensors, also wave sensors, and then as well physical and chemical oceanography. So temperature, oxygen, salinity, chlorophyll A, which is a proxy for, but not a direct measure of biomass, um, CO2 partial pressure, nitrate, an important nutrient, also phytoplankton taxonomy, zooplankton backscatter, and GPS. And the GPS one is an interesting link with the geosphere that I'll come back to later. Subsurface, we also have biogeochemical instrumentation. Um, some shout out to UTAS who have developed a really novel trace metal sampler. And then we have an array of temperature and pressure sensors that extends down to 500 meters. So that allows us to understand how the mixed layer depth in the ocean is changing. And I'd like to point out that SOFTS is now the only air sea flex mooring in the Southern Ocean. There was one other that was maintained by the US um, over closer to the Antarctic Peninsula, but it's a pretty expensive undertaking. It requires repeat visits with the ship to keep the infrastructure in place. And so that program was recently canceled. Okay, so this is um, an attempt at showing the integration of these observations into differing areas of science. So we have, um, papers that have been written by, by some are colleagues, some are people who I don't know, um, working on various aspects of this data. So one of the unique things I think about IMOS and about the Southern Ocean Time Series is that the data is available to everybody, and it's not in real time, but it's available to everybody, and, and, and we have been able to show that people are actually making use of it. So we're having new insights into air sea flexes, so subantarctic mode water is important for storage of anthropogenic carbon, as I've said, but also for getting oxygen and nutrients to the low latitude oceans. Uh, we have papers that look at how the surface carbon dioxide variability changes over time. What controls it? Is it mostly physics? Is it mostly biology? Then we have people who also use this for more biospheric or ecological applications, so understanding the phytoplankton community structure, the phenology, how that might be changing over time, and then building from phytoplankton up a trophic, letter, a tr a trophic level to zooplankton, so looking at export and biological production in terms of not only the base of the food web, the thing that you might be able to observe from space, but also the trophic level that sits above it. And finally, I just wanted to point out this one. This is a relatively new paper from um, Catherine Wynne Edwards, who works at CSIRO. Um, and this is using the moored observations from the long time series to do a validation exercise for those profiling floats that I talked about. So the floats don't actually measure CO2. They estimate it with a lot of different assumptions. And so I would point to these long time series as being very important for baselines, but also very important for calibrating and validating new sensors that might be cheaper and easier to use. Okay, the second one is the so-called um, sediment, the SAS, subantarctic zone, that stands for, sediment trap mooring. So this one is really about measuring the ocean's biological carbon pump. So that's the transfer of CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean. Phytoplankton convert inorganic carbon, CO2, to organic carbon themselves, and then they clump together and sink or get eaten, and there's a transfer of carbon um, in the organic form into the deep ocean. And if it sinks deeply enough, we call it sequestered from re-exchange with the atmosphere, right? So this is an important um, control on moving carbon from one reservoir to the other, and, and has played a, a very important role in setting the atmospheric CO2 concentration over glacial timescales. 
that's nice, shout out to the GSBR. So um, some um, science examples of this are, we, we have a, now a close to 20 year record, and so we know what the particle fluxes at the site are, so what the contribution of the biological pump is. And um, the paper at the, at the bottom there about coccolithophores, which are a particular class of phytoplankton that make particulate inorganic carbon, or chalk, like the white cliffs of Dover. And those have a kind of interesting and different role to play in terms of um, regulating atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Um, and this one is very interesting from a, a recent um, graduate student, Spenya, who now works in New Zealand, which was looking at zooplankton carcasses, so Z dead zooplankton, and trying to figure out how much of a role they are playing in the flux of organic carbon to depth. So a lot of work has recently focused on the different mechanisms that work all together to do this biological carbon pump that we have in the past thought of as just this very simplistic gravitational settling. And this is one of the weaknesses in global biogeochemical models for getting the uncertainty of this the ocean carbon sink to be reduced is a better mechanistic understanding of these biological processes. Okay, oh sorry. All right, so this is this idea of SOTS as a platform for collaboration or a platform for integration across the different spheres of science in the context of this meeting. So as I said, we sit between these two repeat hydrographic lines and we have plans to reoccupy those in the coming years. We um, have a partnership with the Marine National Facility, so we have a very heavy reliance on the ship. We need to get out to the mooring and actually take it out of the water and put a new one in every day, or every year, sorry, not every day. Um, we have strong links to other IMOS facilities, so that's through validation of sensors on the ship, deployment of kit or parallel measurements, and so um, kind of communities of practice in terms of QA and QC of sensors and data. And we have some long-standing international collaborations. I'd like to point out two additional integration efforts. So the first one is um, the SWAT satellite. So um, that was mentioned this morning um, in terms of um, new launches. So that's the surface water and ocean topography. So that one, my understanding of that one is that that is gonna revolutionize the way that we have been able to observe the ocean from space in giving us mesoscale resolution for physical features through altimetry. And so we have a very, um, accurate, precise GPS system deployed on the SOTS mooring, and it's one of the only open ocean sites which will validate this new satellite. So that's a very important um, integrative effort. And the second one is this um, Southern Ocean Large Aerial Carbon Extent. So this is a process study that made the decision to undertake their work at the SOTS site because of the existing background information on the physics, chemistry, and biology of the ocean. And this leads into other work that's been endorsed by the UN Decade, which goes back to understanding the transport of carbon by biology into the interior ocean, particularly the twilight zone, which has been, I think, underappreciated. This is my last one. Um, and so this one comes back to, I think it was Kimberly's comment, which is, um, and others have pointed out, we have lots of data. And we're doing pretty well, I think particularly within Australia and the presence of the AODN for the IMOS program, we're doing pretty well at making that data available and making that data usable. I think um, QA, QC, and data management remains a major challenge, um, particularly as it's more, more, more all the time, these profiling floats, then this eDNA, then this you know, remote sensing, and so it, it piles up. And in order to really get at those questions of attribution of anthropogenic forcing, we need sufficient QA and QC and management of our data so that we're able to answer those questions. And I think that, it, that really is the big challenge going forward. Thank you. Great work there, Elizabeth. Nicely done. You covered a lot in that time. Very well done, and I know it's a big area. Oh, you forgot your thank you slide. So, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, so, I have a different name to what's in the program, but that's okay. I think this is right. Yeah, so this is good. Okay, so um, we now move to our early career researcher presentation, and I'll hand over right now to Kasav. Thank you, Kasav. Thank you, Steve. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Keshav. I'm a postdoc scientist at uh, CSIRO. I've just joined recently, and uh, I'm pretty new to Australia as well. Uh, I want to first thank my fellow ECRs, Dan Lu, Gemma, and Kimberly, who were kind enough to let me talk on their behalf. And my talk is mostly our opinions of what we gathered and our experiences that we have uh, sort of uh, faced during the course of our research. Uh, so moving on. The first thing that's been repeated across uh, the talks throughout today was to actually look at how data was collected, how data was accessed, and uh, how data can be used. So 
we were first of the opinion that we used to make, we need to actually make use of the data that is firstly available across the hydrosphere. And primarily, so when we look at sort of over, when you look at an overview of what is most important in the, in, in the case of hydrosphere, so we, we are mostly interested in inland water that's basically across, uh, spread across rivers and lakes. So you need uh, gauge stations for that. And uh, what you see on the slides is actually a spatial representation of inland gauge stations across the world. Uh, and how frequent we can actually, how frequently are we gathering data across all these sites? And uh, Australia is doing pretty good. So we have data that is being collected across most of the climate domains, quite uh, sort of accessible in a pretty well defined format. But the rest of the world is not so. So, in order to sort of quantify global uh, phenomenon, so that's a very big uh, sort of gap that. We know which is an important variable, but we are not monitoring it in a very concise or in the manner that we actually need to actually validate the models that we forecast. So, and that's also in time as well. So here you have actually how the temporal aspects actually are declining post 1980s. So here, uh, even though you have a big network of uh, rainfall gauges being set up, you don't have a continuous time series that is available across all the different stations. So this is mostly dealing with quantity of water. Uh, in quality, you actually have even further uh, degradation of basically, you don't have very good uh, concise or a comprehensive data set that is available. And what you see is uh, on this map is actually all the sites for electrical conductivity, which is a uh, pseudo surrogate for uh, salinity. So this is actually one of the water quality parameters which is available in abundance, uh, at least in maximum quantity, around 500 stations across Australia up until 2019. And in case of all the other water quality parameters, it's further very less. So at least in the case of water quality, there's an urgent need that we felt that we need a cohesive uh, framework of actually identify which variables are important for water quality and also have that in a place where people can actually access it very easily. So at the end of the day, we need more observation data and we need more sort of comprehensive access to that observation data. Uh, so that's the data aspects. So once we actually make use of these data, we need sort of, uh, we are sort of developing models based on these uh, data sets that are already available. And what we see is that in the case, so I'm a hydrologist, so I just look at inland flooding. So that was one of the uh, flooding events in Hawkesbury. So it's a sentinel SAR imagery. It's more or less associated with the extents. You can't actually see the quality, but you can actually make out what's, uh, what's available over land. And uh, you see that in 2020, it was a very minor flood event, one in five year event. And when you actually move forward the next successive year, you actually have a much bigger flood event occurring and with a much bigger magnitude. So what this is actually means the return period. So one in five years actually signifies the probability that that flood can occur again. But then you have a flood event with a bigger magnitude occurring the next year. So, and that continues in 2022 as well. So you have a much more, uh, you have a bigger event occurring sort of quite continuously across all years. And we are, so, we are not yet able to attribute what causes such frequent floods and what we can actually infer is that the normal is shifting. So it's a quite cliched dialogue, but then it's, you have a, you don't have no idea what's a new extreme. So what does 23 or 24, 2024 bring about? So we need sort of more sort of detailed high resolution sort of atmospheric products in the form of precipitation uh, products as well as uh, topographic uh, uh, DEMs available so that we can actually prepare for and uh, model sort of the higher intensity or the higher magnitude flood events that would be occurring in the future. So a sort of uh, carry over to my next slide. So we actually need a knowledge transfer that we can actually incorporate all the uh, new skills that are sort of coming up, basically AI and machine learning into all these process-based models. So again, looking at it from a flood perspective. So this is a Mahanadi River in, in India from the country I come from. And in hydrology, you usually have a very nice picture of how water is always flowing to the mouth of the river in a one concise manner and all feeds down at the ocean in one, at one mouth. But Mahanadi 
breaks all that. And that's the case for all other rivers across the world as well. You have severe branching in the mouth, and you actually can't actually control flooding in the branching. So it's mostly flat, and you can't actually predict where the water might end up. And that's where actually, that's what you see uh, in 2022. So you have flooding across all five branches, four branches of Mahanadi. And we could actually make use of uh, the satellite time series of images to actually put in the sort of input that is needed into the process-based model to actually model floods in the deltas. So it's a sort of a complex uh, biogeophysical phenomenon that has to be integrated with MLAI skills to actually have a realistic forecast of where different uh, climate extremes can actually occur. And that's the, sec um, that's the last sort of skill set uh, that we want to actually uh, emphasize is that we need to sort of widen opportunities for all the ECRs so that you actually retain talent. And why do, we, why do we want to do it is basically, so for example, if you actually take these, it's another event in uh, New South Wales, closer back home. Uh, here you actually see with regards to all the events that are occurring over land. So you have these uh, forest fires occurring uh, and then you immediately have a flood event following that. So you have all these complex climate extremes that are sort of compounding each other and the effects are still not yet quantified well enough so that we sort of forecast it further into the future. So it's sort of trying to uh, set up a resilient framework so that we sort of develop the skill set and also have the opportunities available to employ those skill sets to sort of make ourselves prepared in case of more extreme climate. So sort of comprehensively sort of focusing it down into our, that rather than those specific steps. So we thought of actually looking at it from a digital twin perspective. So we, where you have all these sort of a cloud, but you can make a visualize of it, visualize it in the sense that you have the data sets across all the interconnected spheres and the models at high resolution all in one place and also accessible so that you actually have an idea so you can actually forecast into the future and look at different scenarios. So it, it would sort of be modeling whatever we expect in the real world, but only thing it's in a digital space and also in advanced in time. So a very big emphasis on invent that requires comprehensive investment, not only from public space. So we, uh, it's sort of, we looked at who, who will do this work. So sort of looking at investments, not only from public money, but also sorry, try to make use of the public-private partnerships. So back in India, this is a very common sort of uh, funding mechanism, but then in research, it's not yet well applied. So sort of trying to take advantage of the corporate social responsibilities of all these big multinational companies and try to make use of their investments into sort of science and sort of it advan it, it, it's basically adding societal value. So that's sort of trying to... Uh, involve not only the scientists, but also the people and the policy makers into uh, the research, managing research coordinations. And ultimately, it always depends on the people who do the work. So sort of develop programs, uh, programs especially for advancing skills of uh, early career researchers so that they are the actual uh, sort of building blocks or the wheels which actually more push us forward. So yeah, definitely looking at uh, incorporating programs for continuous professional growth. So uh, that's all from my end. Thank you for your attention. Well done. I must say, whoever's idea it was, or a group of people's idea it was, to bring early career researchers into this um, must be congratulated. That, that's been fantastic to, um, to have that as part of the mix. And also the first mention of a digital twin uh, in, in today's proceedings, so congratulations there. Um, it's panel time, and the people have spoken, we have listened, people want to see more of the panel up front, so we now have the chairs in front of the stage. You're going to be able to cope with that, Donald? Okay, that's good. And true to form, I'm going to start with you to, to get us rolling there, Dan. Yeah, look, um, uh, I suppose it's complicated, isn't it? Um, Hodges' fear, we've learnt a bit about 
what observations we do have. Um, there are significant gaps in those observations, um, particularly when we come to that coastal space where most of us live. So there's some opportunities there, I think, for coordination. Um, obviously training for the next generation of scientists in machine learning and opportunities for them to, to move into the workforce as well seems to be a, a running theme that we've heard from ECRs all over the country. So. I'm watching you. Uh, yeah, no, um, so, yes, no, interesting to pick up on those, those um, consistent themes. What about from the audience or online? Any terrific? Oh, Tim, you're having a break. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Christian Jacob from Monash Uni and the ARC Center of Excellence for the Weather of the 21st Century. And I just wanted to give a big shout out and hear from the panel from your various spheres on this idea that one great integrator of data or observations are models. And in my field, this is known as data assimilation, and this whole digital twin is just a, an, a new word for the same thing as to how do we bring data or observations and models together, and is there an opportunity to integrate our spheres by building systems or a system that does that across the spheres? Great question for the panel. There you go, Donald. I'll, I'll say some opinionated things, but I, I can't claim any uh, genuine experience in this. I mean, uh, it, it was, it was going to be my, my comment or question in relation to the presentation we just saw. As we start thinking about how the expertise that uh, is encapsulated in the models built uh, by researchers in the hydrosphere or the geosphere, etc., um, if we want to exploit that expertise in order to improve our understanding of the other spheres and the systems in those, then we've got to be thinking together about the entire ecosystem of data products, models, versioning of models, intercoupling of models that will help us all to be able to use the best available and to switch them out as better versions arise. Uh, and I think that is an area which is ripe for really in-depth um, synthesis and collaboration between our areas. So that, I, mean, I, I picture it all as centering still somehow on sharing and building together understanding of process models to help us to understand what are the measurables and variables that could be delivered in order to parameterize and improve those, and therefore setting something of an agenda for the measurements that each of us is collecting in our different domains. But going forward, it would be great if there was a whole new water model that was better at predicting the state variables that are needed for um, predicting vegetation changes, et cetera, or fuel load to be to be able just to switch in the next one. And that really means that we need to have the concept of nationally recommended, if I want to put it that way, models and data products that are the ones which we use as our benchmarks for each area. And that, that again, involves sharing information, I guess. Other panelists? Yeah, thanks, Donald. Does somebody else want to... I, I just want to make a, a comment on that. Actually, that's a question I have in mind as well because we all have like a big data gap in our own spheres and how we can just uh, integrate the data from different spheres and uh, uh, combine the, the observations, the modeling together to benefit uh, the different spheres. And uh, I can uh, have one example from the Antarctica acid models. Like um, uh, we, we have some techniques to do a simulation to combine the uh, measurements and the acid models to try to predict how sea level will rise in the end of this century. But I have to say that we still have quite a big gap in developing this kind of assimilation method. We still have quite large uncertainties in our models, which kind of because of a lack of the data set. 
which uh, uh, limit our ability to understand better about the physics we are still missing in our models, like how the uh, subglacial hydrology affect our basal sliding and uh, how the glacier erodes the rocks beneath the uh, grounded ice and how the uh, ice shelf cavity have this kind of, uh, the, the, the ice ocean direction in ice shelf cavity uh, affect the ocean circulation beneath the cavity and also the fresh water discharge, how it affects the uh, ocean circulation as well in the ice shelf cavity. This kind of questions all rely on the data sets we, we can benefit, benefit from different spheres, but that's kind of a challenge like uh, the, the gaps in the current integrated data. Uh, thing and uh, also another uh, issue related right with the gap is that the inconsistency in the uh, temporal and spatial resolution from different spheres and we all have our you know required resolution but how we you know ben, you know uh, satisfy all of these requirements from different spheres that's another challenge I think. It's a great question, wasn't it? Any other panelists? I was going to jump on about. We were talking about digital twins, I think, was part of the question as well, and um, the comment that a, a digital twin is is essentially a model, but I would actually say that a digital twin, from the experience that I've had with them, which is not much, um, is is quite a static thing. It it represents all the information we have about something, you know, in a, in a digital space but at a point in time when that data was collected whereas a lot of the models that we've been seeing today are very very temporal you know whether it's the the geological models that go over billions of years or the 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 diurnal models that we've just heard about um, from Elizabeth you know with changes from day to night so th those are there there is change over time and that can be modelled, whereas a digital twin, where, where I think we, we would have the opportunity to start bringing all of the data from our different spheres together, um, is, is much more static from what I've seen of digital twins, which might, you know, I've had experience with geological digital twins, but also, you know, uh, government departments will have an infrastructure digital twin of a, of a city and, and, and that sort of thing. So I, I think there's opportunity for growth and somebody had their hand up. Oh, yeah, yep. there. Rebecca's on yep. her way down. Oh, she's there and then there. But, uh, yeah. So I uh, got in first. <laughs> um, so Mark Lindsay from the CSIRO. Um, I've got just a question about, we've been talking about models and data and we talk about uncertainty before as well. And, you know, I'm a geospherist. I uh, occasionally dabble in the other spheres as well. And I think sometimes we don't quite know what's a model and what's data. And sometimes we use models as data. Um, and speaking to data scientists, um, they started using geological maps. So this is an example of something that is most definitely a model. It's not all observed. And when I explain the process of how a geological map was made, I think I almost scare them off geosciences for good. Um, and I was just wondering how we better manage our, I guess, our expectations of what we can obtain from other spheres um, and having a better understanding of what you know, the differences between models and data are. That comes down to metadata then. A, yes, in a way, but it's also, I think, how... Like, even if we knew we could use that data and the difference between the, the two, can we use that data? Is it possible? Like, I was looking at those beautiful um, pH profiles from um, Elizabeth's talk. Would I be able to use the original data in something I want to do in the geosphere? Probably not. But then, yeah, how do I incorporate those pH models, I assume, not tomographic, maybe, um, into something I might want to answer. No, good point. We've just got one down here and then we'll go up the back there. And I think the one down the front was really triggered by digital twins, which of course means so many things to so many different people. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. And so I want to go there. Uh, Andrew Moore from the CSRO. Uh, one of the reasons that I got triggered is that my current job is to build a digital twin 
scare quotes for a moment, I'll come back in a moment, uh, of the Australian agricultural landscape. So the person who said that a digital twin is just a data assimilation exercise is wrong. To properly be a digital twin in the NASA sense, you have to have an actuator in the, in the artefact somewhere that goes back and changes the real world in response to what's going on in the digi digital part of the artefact. Uh, when we talk about digital twins in this general space, we're really talking about what are called digital shadows, which are the things that don't have that completion of the loop. Uh, digital, the digital twin concept is, in fact, fundamentally dynamic. Um, the people who are using, calling things digital twins and using only static data are misusing the term for reasons of being the cool guys, typically. Um, so we need to, you know, this is, a this is a gathering of scientists and we actually need to use rigour in our terms and not get too much caught up in the tech hype around the concept. Um, so that's my two cents worth on those topics. Well said. It was good to hear someone say that. And it's hard work, isn't it? Tim makes it look easy. We've got one up there, Rebecca. Yep. <laughs> now, now that Rebecca's over there, has anyone over here got the next question? <laughs> Tim Brown from the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility. Such a mouthful. Um, now that the topic of digital twins has been broached, I, it's sort of a, some people hate it, some people love it. I, I built a, a VR model of the National Arboretum in 2014, and then when the word digital twin came along, I switched to that. Which, But back to the how do we integrate, one approach would be let's pick an area, like a city with some ocean and some bushland, and try and model the whole thing. You could call it a digital twin or something else, but I, I'm quite sure that as soon as we undergo that exercise, it will fail completely but it will fail in interesting ways because we'll realize that one, all our definitions don't align, and two, none of our data is actually interoperable. And so the reason I like the idea of modeling things that way, whether it's a digital twin or anything else, is because it holds you honest. Like even if the tw model itself is useless, you have to be honest because if none of the trees show up in the right place and all your buildings are wrong and none of the hydraulic processes work, your data's crap, but we, nev we, we never have to prove that our data works and we never have to show anyone in any other domain if our data works because we have our own, oh, I'm doing climate science, so it's global. I don't do climate science in your single trees, right? So if we pick a spot and try and model it, either it works or it doesn't. If it works, we're doing a good job. If it doesn't, we need to figure out what's wrong with our data. Yeah, good call. Does the panel have a resp any responses to, to this? Dan, you look like you might. Oh, I don't know how to say this. Uh, look. Um, <laughs> Maybe the data's okay. Maybe the model's crap. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we've got to think about the data that goes into our models as well and if it's fit for purpose. And I agree with Tim, the interpretability between the spheres is going to be critical for us. But there's always going to be another model. And I'm thinking 50 years from now, you know, what do we want to leave behind? And we probably want to leave behind really good quality QAQC data in the right places with the right variables so someone can build a better model in the future. Yeah. Rebecca's coming. There she is. Um, hello, yes. So one, one piece of terminology that I haven't heard so far, or maybe paraphrased, um, is uncertainty quantification. So, you know, so some things can be trusted more than others. Um, and so when you're trying to integrate um, models and data and you have this data assimilation, you know, task, um, you know, one of the tasks that, that, uh, that you face is, uh, is uncertainty quantification. So how is that dealt with in the, in, you know, in the hydrosphere when you, you know, necessarily have sparse data? Good. Yeah, great question. Dan, you look like you're looking sideways as our hydrosphere rep. That's okay. Uh, I, yeah, look, it's probably not one in my repertoire to answer, but, um, you know, obviously there is uncertainty in the data that we collect and in the data that we model. 
Um, but I think it, it's going to depend on the type of information and variables you're measuring as well in terms of how you quantify that uncertainty. I think the good thing about um, what happens in a program like IMOS is there is a lot of QAQC on the data to ensure that we're, we're minimising that uncertainty and the metadata is appropriate to enable anyone in the world to use that data um, for fit for purpose uses. I think it gets a little bit more challenging when we think about machine learning approaches and citizen science and different data that may come in and might not necessarily meet the needs from all for all applications, but could be really useful for a lot of applications. I'm thinking low-cost sensor networks that might be able to indicate heat waves really accurately, but not may not necessarily have the precision that every physical oceanographer may require, for example. I think the other thing is calibration of observations using different observation types to understand more about the uncertainty, and particularly for new types of technology, that can be a really useful thing as well. Yeah, that's great, Charmaine. Oh, Donald, and then we'll go um, up. And, and, and I suppose one other thing going back to the uncertainty is that whether we're dealing with um, field measurements or um, modelled estimates of the, the, the variables in question, in each case, we need to understand what the, the particular sensors or other m processes were for arriving at those assays. So um, uh, th this comes back to one of the things that was discussed towards the end of the biodiversity session, I think, that we may have very expensive ways of getting really good measurements, and we may have very cheap and easily widely deployed ways of getting less accurate, less reliable measurements. And we may want to use both of them, but the fundamental thing, going back to what you're talking about, your QA, QC, is understanding these came from this type of sensor and this kind of process or were transformed through this model or this algorithm and making sure that those types of uh, associated metadata are ones that we plan for and that we look after and that can be interpreted in the future. And the, the fairness of all, F-A-I-R, capitalized, um, of all our data is really going to depend on how good we are at documenting those aspects. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't stop myself, of course, because um, um, the center that I'm currently involved in is, of course, uh, focusing on uncertainty quantification in data science and using trying to use data science to combine with domain sciences in uh, water minerals and biodiversity. And um, so there is a significant suite of tools available in mathematics and uh, computing around uncertainty quantification. And particularly the uh, climate change community or the climate model community has made a mass uh, significant push in the areas of uncertainty analysis, and, and that was been you know been pushed by the whole climate change debate, which I think is really good. In hydrology, which is my actual actual field, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty quantification going on. The biggest limitations that we run into is that and that we're finding also within our centre is that actually doing that uh, fully across all different processes and all different data becomes computationally quite uh, significant and, and that is still a limitation. If you want to have actually a fully uncertainty quantified model that incorporates all these different elements of uncertainty, then um, your, um, the computing is really going to be, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work still to be done in the whole computing science in terms of making that faster. And um, there's a lot happening also within these physics-informed uh, machine learning in that same area, in the machine learning area. So there is potential. I think, I think it is definitely, I, I agree, that is definitely is something that we need to be working on into the future. It's just right now um, there is still quite some hurdles in terms of doing that actually in practice. And that's, I think, is the, the biggest limitation in terms of uncertainty quantification. I'm all for uncertainty quantification. I think we should be doing it everywhere, but it is, I think, a real big task as part of this whole integration to actually being able to do that in an efficient and fast and easy to do way. And that is, that is I think, is, a, is, is something that we, we often um, 
as a hydrological modeler even, uh, easily forget because it's much easier to just chunk some data into a model and assume that it's all perfect and uh, and run it through the the model and, and do that. So so I think it's just it's another another one of those things that need to be going on the to do list um, for the integrated Earth. Um, but I'm also always reminded, sorry to diverge and to keep talking, I'm also always reminded on Douglas Adams and that um, that one alien who was working on the fjords of Norway for his whole life. Uh, we need to be careful that we're not going in that direction because we can't make it totally perfect and uncertainty free. So we need to, you know, kind of balance those two things and then know how it feeds into our decisions. Sorry, that took a long time. No, that was okay. Uh, let's go there. Yep. Hi, my name is Anu. I'm a data architect from CSIRO. Um, I'm also e EMCR representative for National Committee Data and Science. So I just want to make a suggestion since there are, there are all leadership of NSCRS facilities here. First, shout out, shout out to all the um, early career presentations today. They are great. And I would like to suggest to um, uh, NCRS uh, leadership, why don't you guys um, organize a joint uh, research call for the young researchers um, who can develop, a, to develop a scientific application that integrate data from all these spheres or some of the spheres um, that are relevant to national challenges. Thank you. Wow, you've got in early. I think that, that's, uh, we'll have to also remember that for tomorrow. I think that's where we're going to be heading with some of the discussion. There were there were a few hands. Yeah, sorry, I got a bit lost there. But no, thanks for that comment. Yeah, thanks, Petra Heil from the Australian Antarctic Division. Um, the second last comment uh, really struck me, and that's something I reflected on before lunch. Is um, we come from all the, the different spheres, and we work in different spheres and uh, with different interactions, and uh, especially the uncertainty criteria and discussion um, where we are working, uh, Chris. Christian mentioned before the data assimilation. So you need to know the uncertainty of the data that's going in. If you don't have that, then your assimilation is highly uncertain. You're probably not going to do it. Um, similar when we work with satellite data and bring uh, ground observations or instrument observations in, they need to be characterized, including the uncertainty estimates need to be very clearly associated and documented with the data sets. Otherwise, no one will touch the data set. So, um, in addition to the recent uh, suggestion, I also suggest that out of this year, breakout groups come out or, or forward committees that actually bring uh, representatives and people from the different disciplines, different spheres together and work on that because I think some are advanced in, in certain things and others can catch up and I think together we can enrich each other in that area. Thank you. Terrific. The panel, any? You're my go-to's when there's no hands out there, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm talked way, way, way too much. But we, we, in talking about uncertainty quantification, are there things that we need to be doing to avoid circularity that some of that quantification is based on other data we've collected that where our best versions of those data may already have made use of signals from other data as part of the cleaning process, and therefore do we... Do we need to do anything to worry about that? I've probably got a good example of that, just talking about geodesy with different groups and talking to people that do ocean mapping and groups that are interested in land motion and coming to the conclusion that we don't necessarily use the same datums when we're talking about this type of stuff. So, you know, one of the uncertainties that particularly in the coastal zone when we're talking about bringing some of these fears together is is that mismatch between what we're calling land and what we're calling water and the vertical datum that they're tied to that could be out by half a metre. So if a climate scientist is using that data to project um, coastal erosion or flooding events, it could have a significant impact. So we don't necessarily have the the infrastructure or the programs in place to tie land and sea together like we have seen in some countries, like the program that they've run in New Zealand where they've got a geodesy program specifically in that area. I don't know if Tim's got anything to add there. No, we... Yeah, terrific. Look, I think we're... That's been great. We've had a really good discussion there. I've, I've found I've learned a lot. It's been actually just a couple of interesting observations. Well, I hope interesting observations. You'd be the judge, not me. But um, isn't it interesting that we've had these... Um, 
thematically driven, you know, sphere kind of science discussion or themes, and the discussions have gone very much towards the data. So it's going to be interesting to see how that resurfaces and comes through tomorrow where we have got a specific um, chase down of the data side of things. So that's just one observation that I'll just, just share. And the other one is I think um, there might be some merit in having um, a society called Digital Twins Anonymous where people can stand up and say what they think a digital twin is and confess that in front of all around. Is that, is that a good idea? For... <laughs> Could be scary. Okay, afternoon tea time. Um, so thank you. Uh, thanks to all of the presenters and everyone who's contributed to the discussion. If the people that presented there, if they come up, they get their, their prize, their thank you prize. Um, and otherwise, we shall reconvene at 15.15. .15. Good on you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>